Well, uh, hello everybody, and uh, I would like to welcome you all in uh, our uh, uh, CME activity uh, series. Uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, virtual uh, cardio risk waves, and this is wave number seven. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed the uh, uh, previous uh, six waves. Um, today with me is a great faculty, uh, Professor Atif Al-Bahari, uh, Professor Ahmad Chaw Salafi, and Professor Nabil Farag. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all the participants, audience. Um, I'm glad to have all of you with us. Um, also, I'd like to uh, uh, appreciate the work of ICOM company, <clears throat> who help us in uh, the technical uh, uh, support. Um, uh, great thanks to uh, uh, Abbott uh, uh, Company for their support to see me activity of the IAVA uh, Society. And I will now leave the uh, stage or the microphone to Professor Al-Bahri uh, to introduce the uh, scientific uh, agenda of today, Dr. Atif. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Ashraf Rida. Uh, I welcome everyone, and it's my pleasure to moderate the seventh wave of the card risk, which is uh, enriched by highly caliber experts in the biology. Uh, our focus uh, tonight is, is triglycerides as cardiovascular risk. <coughs> and the agenda will, uh, will be uh, as, as follows. Professor Ashraf Reda will uh, have a presentation <coughs> on the remnant cholesterol triglycerides and uh, residual risk, which is a very important topic. And uh, it's followed by discussion and then uh, a small break. And then we will continue with Professor uh, Dr. Ahmed Bishawi uh, with a limited case and Dr. Nabil Farag, the triglyceride and non HDL triglyceride will be merged all together. And we will have uh, a great discussion when this case is uh, in the show. Now, I, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce <coughs> Professor Ashraf Reda, President of the IAVA, <coughs> and Cardio Risk, and uh, a very important topic, remnant cholesterol, triglyceride, rich lipoprotein, and residual risk. Professor Ashraf. Thank you, Atif. And actually, uh, uh, this topic for me is very interesting. <coughs> we know uh, uh, a lot about the total cholesterol, and we know that LDL cholesterol is very important and we have to measure it and we have to treat it to reduce the cardiovascular risk. But what do we mean by remnant cholesterol? And what do we mean by triglyceride rich lipoprotein? Uh, uh, and then what do you mean, do we mean by the residual risk? First of all, by the residual risk we mean it is the risk of cardiovascular events that persist in people after achievement of the treatment goals. So you are giving your patients the, the, uh, the, the appropriate medical therapy, you reach the goals that according to the guidelines, but still some of your patients have event, have cardiovascular event. This is called the residual risk. Uh, the question now is why this residual risk happened? How could we explain the residual risk? Actually, this residual risk may be related to inadequate lipid management. Problem with the lipid. And the problem with the lipid may be problem of the LDL cholesterol or problem of other lipoprotein particles. We have to tackle it all together. Also, residual risk may be explained by the presence of inflammations. Maybe you have to treat the inflammations present that lead to atherosclerosis. The third mechanism that is responsible for the residual risk is the coagulation. And we have to concentrate on these three parameters to try to minimize the residual risk. But today, of course, we will try to concentrate on uh, the lipid management and the defect in our lipid management that may lead to this residual risk. So regarding the lipid, what are the possible defects that could be present in our management of lipids. Maybe the inappropriate LDL cholesterol goals, and you know that across the years, the goals are uh, uh, becoming low and low every every few years. And, and as we will see in the last, in the recent, most recent guidelines, 
that the LDL cholesterol, for example, in the very high risk is now 55 milligram per deciliter. Maybe we need uh, much, much lower. Maybe you are not good in achieving this goal. So this is the first cause of residual risk. Uh, another, another important part or defect in our management for lipid is that we are not using combination therapy adequately or appropriately because many of our patients may need combination therapy, not only statin, but statin and others. And maybe we are reluctant to use combinations. We are satisfied with the lipid profile we achieved despite that there may be room for combination therapy. The third part in the lipid problems or defects is if you do, if you do not concentrate on the non-HDL cholesterol and the triglycerides. Maybe you are becoming satisfactory with achieving the LDL goal, but you have, after achieving the LDL goal, to look at the non-HDL and the triglycerides. We have also to start, maybe we have to start the lipid lowering therapy earlier in our lives than we are doing now. Um, the last part is remnant cholesterol, and I will try to explain what do I mean with remnant cholesterol, which may be an important part that should be tackled in order to decrease the residual risk that we have after achieving the goals we know. This is, of course, the last guidelines, and as you know, uh, uh, the, we are treating risk, not treating numbers. We are The patient's is low, moderate, high, or very high risk. Uh, we are not dividing our patient to high cholesterol, moderate cholesterol, and low cholesterol. So if you have, for example, very high risk patients, uh, you, you, you have to reach LDL goal less than 55 milligram per deciliter. And these numbers are changing, are changeable. And over the years, a few years ago, the very high risk was less than 70. And before that, it was less than 100 and option less than 70. So this is one of the uh, uh, important part in the guidelines that could achieve uh, minimize the residual risk in our patient by achieving the appropriate LDL cholesterol for each uh, risk category uh, we have. As I told you, we have to focus on combination therapy. And if you look at the guidelines, the guidelines tell you that the first step in assessment of your patient is not to look at the lipid profile from the lab. The first step is to look at the cardiovascular risk assessment. This is the first step. And then according to the cardiovascular risk assessment and the baseline LDL cholesterol, you uh, decide to start high intensity statin therapy for high risk patients to achieve the goals you need. If you failed with high intensity statin, you have to use combination therapy. And according to the last guidelines, the combination is usually, first step is uh, uh, is it uh, uh, Another combination therapy in the guidelines may be ethyl in cases of residual hypertriglyceridemia, especially in those secondary prevention. Uh, uh, fibrates is still in the guidelines, the combination therapy, especially in primary prevention patients after uh, uh, achieving the LDL cholesterol if the triglyceride is still uh, high. Of course, PISC-9, as you know, is one of the important uh, uh, second step in the treatment after statin therapy, trying to reach these aggressive LDL goals, which is very difficult to reach without combination therapy. For example, PISC-9 heptor, we know that it is a uh, cost, uh, high cost, uh, uh, that's why we should put it in appropriate indications. For primary prevention, it is not generally recommended, except if the patient is very high risk, and it is generally uh, a class 2B, and may be considered. And we know class 2A should be considered. 2B may be considered to, to add PSK9 heptor to statin therapy in patients with primary prevention at very high risk, without a familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, it is class one indication in secondary prevention, not achieving the goal with statin therapy. It is also class one indication in familial hypercholesterolemia with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease 
or other risk factors. So when we calculate this residual risk I told you about, yes, we can calculate it. If you look at the major statin trials all over the years, statin achieve a very good achievement actually in cardiovascular prevention. This gray column, the gray column is the placebo group, and the blue column is the statin group. And all, uh, across all of the major trials, famous trials in the last tens of years, we giving the statin therapy compared to placebo, decrease the risk of cardiovascular event. In all the trials, decrease the risk. But if you concentrate and look at the numbers, decreasing the risk from what? number to what number of event what percentage of the event in the placebo from 28 percent event in the placebo group to around about 20 percent in the statin group so despite this achievement we still have 20 percent event rate and if you look at all these trials the blue numbers represent the blue columns represent the event rate with statin therapy but still we have event rate, still we have res, uh, residual risk, so still we have a room to improve our management of patients regarding the lipid lowering therapy to uh, try to minimize this residual risk more and more. Achieve this, you have not to concentrate only on the LDL cholesterol. It is the primary target of therapy. It is the first goal, target of therapy. You have to reach the goal first, according to the risk. But, how, but after uh, reaching the goals, you must look at the non-HDL cholesterol. Why non-HDL cholesterol? Because LDL cholesterol is not the only atherogenic particles, lipoproteins, in our body. We have other atherogenic particles, which is intermediate density lipoproteins, very low density lipoproteins. The only uh, protective particle is the HDL. So all non-HDL cholesterol is acerogenic and it is calculated easily. Total cholesterol minus HDL cholesterol equal non-HDL cholesterol. And I will explain to you what I mean by remnant cholesterol in a while and each relation to the triglycerides. So these parameters should be Explain. This is the lipoproteins in our body. Uh, this is the LDL. We know that LDL is acerogenic. We know that HDL is protective. But there are other particles in our body, as I told you, that are acerogenic. So non-HDL cholesterol is all the other acerogenic particles. It's the cholesterol carried by all these particles. LDL cholesterol, which are, is measured in the lab, is the cholesterol carried by the LDL. And the HDL cholesterol means the cholesterol carried by the HDL. So we measure non-HDL cholesterol is very important. If we look at this uh, important uh, 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 data from JGEMA, uh, uh, published in the JEMA, about managing patients according to the LDL cholesterol, and the non-HDL cholesterol, according to the achievement in these two parts. The first column is a patient, the goal at that time, it is uh, 2012, was less than 100 milligram per deciliter. So the patient achieved the LDL goal, but for the non-HDL goal, uh, goal, it is not achievable. It has non-HDL of more than 130, okay? If we compare that with the same uh, other group of patients with the same LDL goals achievement, but also with HDL goal achievement, here you will find that there is a difference in the risk reduction. So if you achieve both, if you control LDL and non-HDL, you will get more benefit and less cardiovascular event than if you control only LDL and leave the non-HDL uh, 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 not at the goal or high enough. Other important uh, uh, phenomena that should be uh, uh, understood uh, uh, to explain the residual risk is that sometimes you are looking at the LDL cholesterol after treatment 
and it is, for example, 100 milligram per deciliter. Okay. This patient also has LDL cholesterol of 100 milligram per deciliter, but uh, it is very clear that this patient has small particle size. This is large particle size, but the amount of cholesterol, cholesterol carried by uh, all these particles equal to the amount of cholesterol inside all these particles, despite that this patient has atherogenic LDL cholesterol, more atherogenic LDL cholesterol than this patients. So LDLP is a very important parameter that should be analyzed in addition to LDLC, which LDLC means the LDL cholesterol, the cholesterol in the LDL. And here it is equal in both group of patients. But if you measure LDLP in both particle size, particle number, here LDLP is high, uh, up to 70% more particles and here is more acerogenic. When this happened, when the, you, you have the LDL cholesterol is 100, what could change the particle size from big to small? Lifestyle, smoking, obesity, and the high triglycerides. High triglycerides, when present, change the particle size from large particle size to small particle size. Let us look at some metabolism or some data about the lipoprotein particles in our body. Uh, most of the uh, uh, lipoproteins particles are derived and the cholesterol and drugs are derived from the liver. The liver produces the very low density lipoprotein, while the intestine from the diet produces the chylomicron. Both of these particles are rich of triglycerides which is synthesis in the liver and synthesis in this uh, small intestine. Reaching this high triglyceride stimulate the HDL to uh, do some lipid exchange between the two particles. The second step due to this lipid exchange is to form remnant particles from both. This is remnant particles and this is remnant particles. But here I want you to, to uh, make your attention to a very important point. This remnant particles is present in circulation for few hours after meals, after food, then disappear. Uh, for the, uh, this uh, pathway, it ends in LDL cholesterol after a few hours, and for this pathway, it ends in the, in the by, uh, um, engulfing in the liver, by the liver receptor. So if you want to assess these remnant particles, you have to measure the lipid profile in the non-fasting state. If you measure it in the fasting state, you will measure the cholesterol in the LDL cholesterol only. But in the non-fasting state, it will include also, in addition to LDL cholesterol, the cholesterol in the remnant particle that appear after food and disappear within fever. And that's what I mean by the remnant cholesterol. And the question is whether this remnant cholesterol is acerogenic like LDL or not. Again, to explain what I mean by remnant cholesterol, it is the cholesterol carried by chylomicron remnant, very low dense lipoprotein, and intermediate dense lipoprotein. So it is the cholesterol in the lipoprotein particles other than LDL and HDL. We know that LDL and HDL carry cholesterol in our body, but these particles, especially in the postprandial state, are also carrying cholesterol. How could I calculate it? Remnant cholesterol, you say, we, total cholesterol in all these particles minus the LDL cholesterol, cholesterol LDL, and the HDL cholesterol. It's easy to calculate. And this is uh, 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 diagrammatically illustrating the, the, the triglyceride reach remnant lipoprotein. These triglyceride reach remnant lipoproteins are present in our body after food for a few hours. It is filled with remnant cholesterol, filled with triglyceride, APOB, and APOC. It is uh, uh, from coming, coming from the chylomicron remnant, the very low dense lipoprotein and intermediate density lipoprotein. 
is this remnant cholesterol is acerogenic? This is the antima, this is the plasma, this is the blood vessels. The LDL, you know that a small particle size LDL can penetrate the antima, leading to atherosclerosis, as you know. Also, the re this remnant lipoproteins con with its remnant cholesterol can, this in the same way, penetrate and lead to atherosclerosis and the interaction with macrophage like LDL. In addition to this, it produces free fatty acids uh, uh, due to its uh, high triglyceride content, which is increase the level of inflammation and atherosclerosis. So the remnant cholesterol is acerogenic. Let us look at the relation of triglyceride to this remnant cholesterol. If the triglyceride level is getting higher, if you go from your left-hand side to your right-hand side, here the triglyceride is, uh, 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 in this column, is higher than the triglyceride in this column. This green column is the HDL. So the higher the, HD, the triglyceride, the lower the HDL. So this is the first effect of high triglyceride in the body. It lower the HDL cholesterol. Then what about the effect of triglyceride on the LDL cholesterol? The higher the triglyceride level, no effect on the LDL cholesterol. It is the same. Okay? So what about the remnant cholesterol? The effect of triglyceride on the remnant cholesterol? Okay, this is very, very important. The higher the triglyceride level, the higher is the remnant cholesterol. And here is the relation between the triglycerides the remnant cholesterol, and atherosclerosis. And this is the importance of measuring lipid profile in the postprandial state, in the non-fasting state, because this is the only way. Because if you have if you have a serogenic lipid and you have high remnant cholesterol, huh, you will have postprandial hypertriglyceridemia. That's why when we do non-fasting lipid profile, the LDL, HDL, is not affected by the uh, and total cholesterol is not affected by food. Triglyceride and the remnant cholesterol is on, is the only one affected by food. So you can do non-fasting lipid profile at least to assess if if your patient has high triglycerides in non-fasting state. That means that your patients may have high remnant cholesterol. You can do a fasting level to compare. After that, no problem. This is in the Copenhagen general population study, uh, looking at the distribution of high triglyceride in the general population. And actually, 27% uh, 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 of the general population have elevated triglyceride. Of course, the severe uh, monogenic hypertriglyceremia is present in 0.1%, a very rare situation with triglyceride in thousands. But uh, the level of triglycerides around 200. 250, one, one, oh, above, above 150 is maybe 27% of the general population. So why triglyceride is a dilemma? Triglyceride is a dilemma because we know that triglycerides are the bad lipid that affect atherogenic particles. It render LDL cholesterol acerogenic. However, despite that, we are keeping telling you that LDL cholesterol is the first line of primary goals of therapy. But you should look at the non-HDL and the triglyceride and the remnant cholesterol. When to treat high triglyceride levels, I will see. I will leave this to the uh, 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 presentation, uh, following the presentations and the case presentation. But before I finish, I would like to uh, give a hint about the effect of, possible effect of the phenofibrates on the triglycerides, LDL particles, and remnant cholesterol. Because actually, phenofibrates or its active component, the fibric acids, act through uh, activation of the paper alpha in the liver, leading to lipolysis of the triglyceride-rich particles, increased plasma clearance of triglyceride-rich particles, increased oxidation of fatty acids, decreased triglyceride synthesis, Decrease the level of dense LDL subfraction, increase HDL, and may decrease the lipoprotein little a. It also decreases APOB level, which is uh, uh, 
uh, uh, may lead to uh, uh, improvement of the particle size and increase the APOA uh, level, meaning that you have some increase in the HDL with upregulation of the senses of cholesterol transporter. In addition to these, because of the mechanism of action on the paper alpha, it can decrease the plasma fibrinogen level, C-reactive protein, and uric acid level. Anyway, the guidelines telling you, still telling you that statin number one, azitimib and piskinine number two, looking at the triglyceride, it was a pentacyl, and still phenofibrates have some role. And I will thank you and leave the mic to Dr. Uh, uh, Atif and Dr. Ahmed Shaw. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ashraf, for your elegant uh, presentation. Of course, the triglyceride uh, and uh, steroid remnants are very important. And there are some points which are, which are confusing, for somewhat confusing. The first one, if there is a definite difference between the way of LDL cholesterol inducing atherosclerosis and the uh, way of the triglyceride remnants. Is there a difference between them and in, in the injury of the, uh, of the arteries? Uh, again, the questions, because I was uh, stopped sharing these uh, slides, yeah. the difference between... Um, uh, if there is a difficult, uh, a definite difference between LDL cholesterol and cholesterol remnants and the triglyceride okay. in inducing the tri uh, the atherosclerosis. Yeah. yeah, okay. Both of them are atherogenic. Both of them can penetrate uh, uh, subantimal, and both of them can lead to interaction with macrophage, with plaque formations, uh, inflammatory pro uh, and atherosclerotic uh, process. In addition to that, the remnant cholesterol uh, uh, can be catalyzed and producing a large amount of free fatty acids because of each high triglyceride content. And this free fatty acids is uh, uh, very uh, stimulating to the inflammation. So we have a higher inflammatory process if you have higher triglyceride, if you have higher remnant cholesterol compared to LDL cholesterol, but both of them are associated. It leads me, me to uh, another question. Uh, why we when we measure the, uh, the LDL, the LDL is a calculation, not a measurement from the blood. Yeah. And the same is cholesterol remnants are, are calculation. Why the argument and why the decisions of the, of the people making the guidelines uh, if not uh, to put this equation in order to uh, prevent the cardiovascular uh, disease and atherosclerosis uh, as we do with the LDL cholesterol, because okay. the cost is zero, is nothing. Uh, well, okay, let us uh, define what is we mean by LDLC or LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol means the cholesterol carried by the LDL particles. Okay, this cholesterol carried by the LDL particle, or or what we call LDL cholesterol can be calculated either from an equation or by direct assay. And they found that they are near together. There is no much difference if you do by the equation or either by direct assay. Why you are using these parameters? Because most of the clinical trials using the LDL cholesterol for the baseline assessment and for risk assessment, and they're using it as a target of therapy. And you, they found that when you reduce the LDL cholesterol by certain amount, you get certain amount of benefit. But as I uh, explained in the first few slides, that despite these, we have the residual risk. That's why we should not only look at the LDL the cholesterol, but we should look at the cholesterol carried by the other particles, which can be easily, as you said, calculated by total cholesterol, minus the cholesterol in the LDL, minus HDL cholesterol, uh, equal the, the uh, uh, LDL. There is other parameters that can give you an idea about the atherogenic profile in our body. For example, in the APOB. APOB, part, APOB protein is present one APOB protein with each LDL cholesterol particles. So if you have 
many apoB you mean that means that you have smaller particles of the LDL cholesterol compared to when we have the same level of LDL cholesterol and lower apoB level so apoB is a risk stratifier important when you found that your patient LDL cholesterol is 100 and you want to know or, or 70 and you want to know whether he is still atherogenic or not look at the apoB which is actually a secondary target of therapy in the guidelines the apoB the non hdl cholesterol level and some recommend as i uh, mentioned in the last few slides the ldl particle number or particle size uh, the last uh, question for me when you recommend the fasting the triglyceride and the non-fasting the triglyceride well uh, Generally, I recommend non-fasting lipid profiles. Why? Because it is uh, easier for the patient to go to the lab in the non-fasting state rather than telling your patient that you have to fast for 12 hours or 14 hours to go fasting to the lab. Uh, so it is easier. And second of all, it makes no difference in the LDL cholesterol, which is the primary target of therapy. The only part affected by the fasting or non-fasting state is a triglyceride. So, for example, if you do non, if you ask for non-fasting lipid profile, and you find that the LDL is the same, non-fasting and fasting, no problem. The total cholesterol will be the same, and the HDL will be the same. Now, come to the triglycerides. If your patient come back to you with a triglyceride of 140 or 150 in the non-fasting state, why we do repeat it and do a fasting state? This is okay even in the non-fast. But if your patient come to you with a non-fasting 300, triglyceride 300, I will repeat it in the fasting state to look at the difference between the fasting and non-fasting. And this difference represents the remnant cholesterol and the triglyceride level and is a good marker for the risk of the patient. I see many questions in the eyes of um, Professor Ahmed Shawi. And... Uh... I will uh, let him ask you. Ahmed, Please, Ahmed, Ahmed. Who's with us. I think uh, he's... Uh... Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm with you. And a, a lovely presentation, as usual, Professor Ashraf. Um, uh, I, I was laughing. Uh, no, I was a little bit of a smile because um, uh, a lot of the points Professor Atif were, uh, was asking about uh, maybe pertaining to part of the presentation we're going to talk about. Uh, very, very intriguing questions, Professor Atif. Okay. If there is any questions, you can take the break. Atif, when when send the presentation to Doctor Ahmed. Okay. Thank you, Professor Ashraf. Second, Professor Ahmed. We'll have a break for a few minutes, and we we come back. Just just a half or uh, half minute or one minute. Max. Okay. Okay. Uh, Professor Atif, uh, thank you all. Uh, Professor Ashraf, Professor Nabil, it's always a pleasure being uh, engaging in uh, these lovely discussions with the IAVA. And today we're going to discuss a case presentation uh, on dyslipidemia. Um, this patient is actually a male. He's non-smoker. He's 60 years old, presenting with a blood pressure of 148. He's coming for regular checkup. This uh, the kind of patient in our uh, clinics. Professor Nabil, it's always a pleasure being uh, engaging. And he is, um, his lab results are normal. His lipid and profile was being done for a checkup. His total uh, cholesterol was 165. His triglycerides were 255. His LDL was 121 and HDL was 32. He has medical history of arterial hypertension. He's not a smoker. He was a smoker before and stopped three years ago. And he's on amlodipin and coming just for checkup. So uh, the first question, uh, and that was very uh, elegantly asked by Professor uh, Atif al-Bahari, because we have in this case an elevated triglycerides, and this is non-fasting lipid profile, do we have to do a fasting lipid profile? So let's take a look at the guidelines. Actually, when we look at the American guidelines for management of hypercholesterolemia and lipid disorders, actually, yes, if you have a non-fasting triglyceride level above 400, you have to repeat it because here you might have incorrect assessment of the LDL. 
So if you have a triglyceride above 400, I would really repeat the fasting uh, with a fasting one. But again, I agree, Professor Ashraf said it elegantly, we don't use uh, fasting anymore, we use non-fasting. But if you have a triglycerides which are elevated, then you go to the fasting. And uh, this is what Professor uh, Atif was talking about, the Friedwald equation or the formula on the calculation of LDL, whether in millimoles or in milligrams. A lot of the times, yes, LDL is not uh, measured directly, it is calculated. And the problem is, if you have a very high triglyceride level, you might have quite a low uh, LDL level. So this is important to take into consideration mm -hmm. that if you have severe hypertriglyceridemia, your LDL levels, the calculated LDL levels might not be so accurate. And of course, you have to always look on the causes of hypertriglyceridemia. There are so many causes, whether primary, whether secondary, and uh, um, a lot of them are overlooked, like even drug intake, alcohol intake, some endocrine diseases, renal diseases, pregnancy. So hypertriglyceridemia might be a genetic problem, a primary problem, a genetic susceptibility, and a lot of the times it could be secondary to diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and very importantly, of course, if you are uh, very bad in your eating habits. So what do you think the cardiovascular risk? Professor Ashraf elegantly told us that we have to risk stratify our patients. Uh, I'll have a question, Professor Atif. What type of risk assessment tool do you usually use in uh, uh, these patients coming to you to your outpatient clinic? We should check their polypoproteins. Okay. And we should uh, also... Uh, uh, we made uh, the lipid profile okay, but the, the non HDL cholesterol should be measured. Okay. And the abolibo routine. Okay. And, and do you use a risk stratification way uh, to assess the risk of these patients? Do you use like the score chart, the American Heart Association, or the risk score, uh, or, or do you use uh, the Framingham? What type of score risk assessment do you usually use, Professor Ashraf and Professor Altuf? Of course, you are for, um, uh, following the uh, European Society of Cardiology because I think it was the last one or yes. the most recent one, the score system. The score uh, system. This, this patient is 60 years, he is a smoker, uh, uh, hypertension. Uh, non smoker. Non smoker. Non smoker, right. Non smoker. Now. He was uh, a smoker at the time, yeah. Former smoker. Former smoker, yep. Okay. So, so we lose the, the, the score system of the European Society of Cardiology. First things in all guidelines, like you, pro, uh, you said elegantly, um, you have to assess the risk, whether it's dyslipidemia, whether it's diabetes, whether it's atherosclerosis, whether it's hypertension, you have to. You don't need a lot to use the risk score model if you have a patient with evidence of cardiovascular disease, a diabetic patient, chronic kidney disease, familiar hypercholesterolemia, or a very elevated risk factor in here, it's an LDL of above 190. But this patient actually has so many risk factors, like Professor Ashraf was talking about, his male. What we add or don't add it, but again, the LDL is above 115. His high density lipoprotein is below uh, um, 40, and this is also a risk factor for males. But again, like Professor Ashraf was talking about, triglycerides is a risk factor. Mm -hmm. Having a triglyceride level above 150, this is also a cardiovascular risk factor. So we put the patient and we calculated him according to his, uh, I'm sorry, he's not a smoker, and he got a, um, a risk calculus of four. What does four mean? Actually, four means that in the next 10 years, there is a 4% chance he will die of cardiovascular strokes, myocardial infarction, or sudden cardiovascular death. But if you want to calculate the total events for males, you multiply this by three. So it's 12% that this patient will die or have a myocardial infarction or have a stroke, and this is extremely high. And as we know, Egypt is a very high risk country. And in the newer guidelines that were published in 2019, some risk assessments are even underestimating the risk in our country, like in Egypt, Georgia, Russia, Syria, and so on and so on. So actually this patient is not a very high risk. 
uh, this patient is not a high risk. This patient is a moderate risk because the calculated score is around four. The lower risk is one that shows a risk calculated below one. So first of all, we calculated the risk of our patient, which is very important. So what after the risk? Do we do it in one? We could do it in many other ways. This is the risk pooled cohort equation of the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology. Again, this is a moderate risk patient. This is not a very high risk patient or a high risk patient. But again, this is a risky patient and we have to control him. And my question goes to the panel, Professor Nabil. It's always lovely to have you, Professor Nabil. I would like Thank to you. ask you, um, in in these patients, whether moderate or high risk, I'm not talking. I'm not talking about patients without established cardiovascular disease, and he's not diabetic. Do you sometimes uh, write aspirin, or you think aspirin is over for primary prevention? Thank you, Ahmed, for these uh, very nice questions. I, I would like um, um, uh, to comment first on the risk score, um, and I would like to stress on the use of this important risk score. And some patients definitely they don't need. Such a score, for example, patients with established cardiovascular disease, uh, with diabetic patients, patients, uh, diabetic patients with organ damage, or or because we have some uh, risk categories of diabetic patients, either very high or high or moderate risk, already put in a risk category, and this this risk score was made uh, specifically for patients who looks normal, who looks uh, asymptomatic, who comes to your clinic uh, just to do checkup and you discover that the cholesterol is high, blood pressure is high, or you discover to have uh, them, uh, uh, smokers or things like this. In this type of patients, uh, risk score are used uh, to assess the risk category of such patients. Uh, and this is a very important point to highlight as regard the risk score. Uh, and as you said that we have uh, two risk scores, one for low risk countries and one for the high risk countries. And uh, Egypt actually is more than a high-risk country. And in the new guidelines, um, um, Egypt is considered not a very high risk, but it, it, as the cardiovascular mortality is very high in, in our country, it yeah. is more than uh, uh, a high-risk score to be used in our country. So, for example, 4% in, in, in Europe equal 8% in our yeah. country. So the risk is... is is double that of uh, patients at low risk countries like that of European. As regard the use of aspirin in a such patient who is moderate or high risk without evidence of cardiovascular disease, I think I will not use aspirin in such patients because the new guidelines and everything shows that uh, there is no benefit and maybe the risk of using aspirin in such patients may be more than the benefit of uh, using an aspirin. Aspirin is recommended in patients with evidence of cardiovascular disease or patient or a very high risk patient, but those with a moderate or high risk patients uh, is not recommended to be used as a prophylax. So aspirin is downgraded a lot in, uh, uh, based on the new data and new guidelines. So this, thank you so much for your comments. It's always appreciated, Professor Nabil. And yet aspirin has shown no benefit for moderate to high risk, non-diabetic or diabetic patients, the ARRIVE and the ASCENT trials. So actually it might increase a little bit the GI bleeds, but it does not confer any benefit for protection. So my question in our patient who is just coming for a follow-up, he's not complaining. What are your targets? Professor Ashraf, Professor Atif, Professor Nabil, anybody of you, would you just lower his LDL, non-HDL, triglyceride level lowering, or maybe we can think of all of them if we can. Uh, then, uh, Ahmed, I, um, I would like to stress that still uh, the primary target for uh, our uh, treatment is LDL. So the LDL lowering is our primary target. And we have to look at the triglycerides if the triglycerides is very high. For example, if it exceeds a 500, so it will be taken as a primary target in such condition. But uh, in, 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 in a patient with uh, a triglycerides less than 500, we have to look at the LDL and the LDL is our first target. And later on, we treat the LDL with statins or anything we, we can use for lowering such LDL and uh, recheck the lipid profile after, for example, six weeks, and if the triglyceride is still high, it, it will be our second target. 
Professor Ashraf, you said that lovely in your lecture that there is still a residual risk, even with the best of studies. So what do you think? Well, this patient is a moderate risk patient. Yep. Uh, for a moderate risk patients, we have goals for moderate risk. We have goals first regarding the LDL cholesterol. Uh, then after achieving the goal of LDL cholesterol, we are looking at the non-HDL cholesterol and the triglyceride. But first of first to give statin therapy to uh, achieve the LDL goal. I want to raise a point here is that in moderate risk patients, if you look at the guidelines, it will tell, tell you that you have to do lifestyle intervention first. Uh, this is very difficult to me because I assume that a 60 years old male with bad lifestyle for 60 years will very difficult to change his attitudes in the coming years. I don't know whether we should strict to these points or we, we you, what, what do you do, uh, Ahmed? You will start uh, lipid therapy in, if this patient in your clinic you write to him now statin therapy or you prefer lifestyle intervention first okay um um I, I, I will i will tell you what i do if this patient has any other extra risk factor he's four he's borderline moderate to uh, to high mm -hmm. so if this patient has any other risk factor like a, like say a positive family history of premature vascular disease or anything I might just push quickly to statins. But this patient actually was very good on, uh, he very healthy on his diet. He's not. What was obese. the LDL cholesterol, Ahmed? It was 120 something, uh, 26. So, uh, it's so over. There is oh, yeah. Something called the risk stratifier. What about the risk stratifier? So, so this patient, yes, I was thinking about it. Uh, Professor Atif, what do you think? Do you look, you the question is, uh, is confusing, the Professor Atif. Because all the guidelines, uh, of, of course, will really state it, the uh, number A. But, but uh, these patients, and from the guidelines and from all what I read about triglycerides, the triglyceride for this patient is 150. Yeah, above 150, yes. Above 150. And yeah. it's stated in the primary prevention in the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, that if this patient is above uh, 150, you, you should treat the triglyceride as a primary prevention. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. And actually, this is what we don't look at in the guidelines. Professor Ashraf, Professor Atif, Professor Nabil have highlighted. LDL, first of all, is the most important for atherogenesis. Non-HDL is also an important goal. If you have a high-risk patient, you go for 100. If it's not uh, moderate risk, you go to 130 for the non-HDL and 85 if you have a very high-risk patient. Apolipoprotein B also is another risk factor if you have recurrent events and sometimes uh, the European guidelines uh, really appreciate uh, using it sometimes. But triglycerides is written in the guidelines and we don't look at it a lot. Yes, when you have a triglyceride level below 150, you have a lower uh, risk of uh, developing cardiovascular problems and this is also important. We're not only looking at the 500 and 800, which can cause pancreatitis, and this is another problem. We're also looking at the cardiovascular risk that Professor Ashraf was talking about, the, the residual risk. So I'm not going to go through this. This is simple. An LDL, if it's 55, yes, it's for the very high risk, below 70 in your high risk patients. And now in your moderate, it's not 115, it's 100. So again, we're going lower and lower with the guidelines. If we look at 2016 on the left and 2019 on the right, we're going lower to all uh, categories except, of course, the low risk. We don't have to go below 100, uh, more than 115. And this is, again, explanatory. So don't forget your triglycerides. Again, yes, we start with the highest uh, tolerable dose of statins, and the statins are, according to their uh, efficacy, are high or moderate or low risk uh, or low intensity. But here comes the most important question for our patient. Our patient is 126. His target is 100 for the LDL. His triglycerides are 260 something. And here we have two goals. We have the LDL, we have the triglyceride uh, goal too. Here, Professor Ashraf, Professor Atif, I would like to ask you, what you would start with? Would you go for statins first, yeah. fibrates, Maybe statin first use a combination. The, statin first, and then after two months, I will look at the LDL cholesterol, whether I am at the goal or not. If uh, I am at goal, I will look at the uh, non-HDL and triglycerides. If not at goal of LDL cholesterol, you may start 
uh, with combination therapy after these two months period. Okay. Professor Ash uh, Atif, sorry. I'm not going to repeat uh, what uh, my dear uh, uh, friend Ashraf said, uh, because we make all the same. We start with the statins and, and then the combination with isotomide and, uh, and then we can start. But again, for your confusing equation, again, okay. Uh, this patient, as we said, he has triglyceride over 150. Yes. Okay. The statins reduce the triglyceride when we started from 7 to 20 percent reduction of the triglyceride. While the fibrates reduce it from 20 to 35. Okay. If, if I if I want to add, okay, I will measure the after eight weeks the LDL and the triglyceride. If it goes down, I will continue with the statin, okay? But if not, I will make a combination with the statin and fibrates for the triglyceride. Because our aim is not to treat the, the uh, with fibrates when it reaches more than 400 because we are afraid from pancreatitis. We are in primary prevention. And the message is we treat for primary prevention. Because this patient has a moderate risk, we don't want him to put him in another category like a high risk. And don't Thank forget you, lifestyle intervention for the high triglyceride. Yes, it's a very important lifestyle uh, in, in, intervention, but we uh, we, we should know uh, that the, the people are not able to walk in the on the streets uh, in, in the gardens. It's it's also confusing because lifestyle in our moderate life here we don't have the places to go to go for and this patient is 60 or over 60. what a lifestyle for him now yeah. I, at I least diet at least diet control at least diet actually thank you this is very important triglycerides uh are i can't hear you very Sorry. market uh, can you hear me now is this better yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, triglycerides um, work very well or go low with good lifestyle modification, especially exercise and good eating. But the thing is, like Professor Ashraf was talking and Professor Atif, the first is the LDL goal. Always, whether it's high risk, whether it's secondary prevention, whether it's uh, primary prevention, you have to control the LDL goals. And you look at the ASC guidelines, statins are recommended for the first as the first drug in high risk individuals. And then you add so and so. And even in primary prevention, first of all, what do they look at? The LDL goal. Then the triglyceride goes. So triglycerides are very important. But again, giving statins uh, is as marked and LDL goal is good. And so and so does the American guidelines. Yes, I agree totally. If you have an extreme elevation of the triglycerides and that's what they say, yes, you have to go primary for reduction of the triglycerides because of the problems. Number two, like Professor Atif was actually lovely way saying, and Professor Ashraf, secondary causes of hypertriglyceridemia like obesity, diabetes, chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease. And here it depends. If your triglycerides are above 175 to 400, you're talking about primary prevention, coronary artery disease. If it's much elevated like 500 or 1000, you're talking about the disease that might affect the pancreas. And again, this is a really big problem. Mm -hmm. So this our patient. Actually, he received a torvastatin, which went up to 40 milligrams. His LDL was controlled very well, but his triglycerides, again, were above. So what would you do in this? And he is actually, from the start, very well controlling his risk factors, his, his, his diet and everything. Mm -hmm. Would you consider this as acceptable and stop? Would you add a fibrate, add a different statin, change to icosapent ethyl, which is shown in the reduced reduction of mortality, or add a PCSK9 inhibitor? And this is the question that we really want to discuss a little bit, Professor Ashraf. Well, um, as you uh, was explaining uh, before the start of the presentations, and you uh, uh, point to a very uh, interesting point that is, Icosapent ethyl in the guidelines should be the second step here. Okay. Slides, but however, it was tested in uh, secondary prevention uh, trial. Uh, uh, so, first of all, this triglyceride should be treated. LDL cholesterol here is okay. Uh, I, I don't think azetamide should be, should should be here the second line of therapy. 
we will forget about the thamai because we are below uh, uh, 100 milligram per deciliter LDL, so LDL is okay. Now we, we have to treat uh, 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 triglycerides. Uh, most of ethyl and phenofibrate, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, <coughs> are class 2 indications. Uh, Ecuzapent is uh, becoming class A, class A, class one indication, Ahmed, or class two? In the what you found? Ecuzapent size. We, we, we'll show this in the guidelines uh, immediately. I'll show you. I'll show you in the guidelines immediately. Okay, Professor Atif, your comments, please. Okay, uh, this uh, nothing. This is acceptable for the LDL, but it's trying is right for primary prevention should be. Uh, defined and should be below 80, 85. And so, uh, for the price and for the uh, the, uh, the prevention, I can add the fibrate with the statins. But uh, uh, because the fibrates uh, are has nothing to do with, with the statins, uh, no myalgia or, or 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 no side effects. Uh, so I I can add the fibrate. Because the uh, in D, when I add the BUFA or uh, eco spintile acyl, okay, this is for secondary prevention and for a very high risk patients. And there is another, uh, there is a new one for revascularization, which reducing the uh, the, uh, the stenosis and reducing the mortality and morbidity of, of the disease. So I will add the fibrate. Dr. Atif, uh, actually, a uh, point, a very important point, Ahmed, allow me, uh, which is the cause. Uh, because uh, 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 omega-3 is not all omega-3 yes. are the same. Ecosapantethyl is a pure form of omega-3. Uh, it's a little bit expensive. Uh, some may give the ordinary or usually omega-3, which is not indicated in these cases. So either you can afford to start ethyl or uh, gi you, gi you give phenofibrates, especially that both of them are class two indication. And we, I should warn, uh, Dr. Ashraf, I should warn from the omega-3 what we have in the, in the market and in, in the States, in Egypt, uh, everywhere. All the omega-3 are in the products of fish, in the products. And these in the products are not clear, are not purified and, and can be harmful. And so we should differentiate between the ecosyl, the new one, which is very expensive, and the omega-3, which are given in a, in a potter, because uh, they increase the LDL plus zero. So I, I must uh, point for this point. Okay. First of all, um, a, a very valuable comments. Um, we agreed statins. And um, in the reduced study that was in, uh, included in icosapentethyl, they were using four grams. Um, a lot of the patients were secondary prevention, but there were also high-risk patients. So in high-risk or above patients, and that is the statement of the guidelines, icosapentethyl can be used in preference because of the reduced study because of reduction of mortality as a 2A. But in primary prevention, with no high-risk Category here, the best is using a fibrate, whether phenofibrate or bezofibrate, bezofibrate. This is the best to control the hypertriglyceridemia. So, icosapent ethyl actually does not have any data in our moderate risk patients. It only had in very high risk and some high risk patients. And again, it only showed that in the four grams. If you give it in lower doses, no benefit uh, is known. We don't know anything about it. But the question is, because we know there are so many fibrates, we have gem fibrozil, we have phenofibrate, we have bezofibrate. So there is a question. And we have to know that the data about fibrates is multiple. It's not just one study. It's six or more multiple controlled randomized studies. And actually, the reduction of morbidity and mortality in these patients is always due to the non-HDL. And again, this is why non-HDL, not only LDL, is important for reduction of morbidity and mortality. Of course, triglycerides, we've discussed that. So this is really important. And we've seen with phenofibrate, especially in the field, in the ACR, there is reduction of stroke significantly, and there is reduction of coronary revascularization and unstable angina. And the problem always arising with phenofibrates, or sorry, with fibrates, was the problem with gem fibrozil. 
which was the adverse reactions and interactions and the increase in myopathy that is very increased five to times more than that as seen uh, with other fibrates when added to statins. And this is a problem. So it's not all fibrates are the same. Fibrate is probably the best. So to take home, not to take most of your time, risk stratification, as we've seen, is the number one. And this is important to take. LDL is still the number one uh, target. Don't forget about triglycerides. Triglycerides increase a cardiovascular risk, and it is a cardiovascular risk modifier that we should take into consideration. In primary prevention, the data is there for phenofibrate and mesofibrate, and phenofibrate is better with better data and more consistent data with no adverse events. But icosapent ethyl is seen only in very high-risk patients or high-risk patients sometimes, or as we can call it a little bit, most of it's secondary prevention. So actually, in primary prevention, it's always phenofibrate, I think, is the best, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm willing for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, Ahmed. Uh, uh, I have uh, two questions from uh, the audience, uh, one for Dr. Uh, Ashraf and one for Dr. Ahmed. Dr. Ashraf, the, the question is, uh, after how long after meal and uh, the triglyceride and remnant cholesterol should be done? Uh, if you want to do, to, to do non-fasting or fasting? Yeah. Non-fasting. Non fasting, uh, non fasting within few hours. Yeah, it's 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 not uh, recommended certain hours. But if you wanted to do fasting, it is ten to twelve hours after the last meal. Okay. Uh, better to be after dinner uh, to do it okay. in the early morning, and that's why it, why it is difficult to tell your patient to awake in the early morning, go to the lab, and there is no big difference between the two. Okay, another uh, question for Dr. Ahmed. Uh, some colleagues uh, are confusing because they, uh, they, he asked, are all fibrates alike? And you mentioned here now in your slide, there is a gifibrozole, which should not be given with the statins, and the phenofibrates. So are there any phenofibrates or all the same? Um, okay, uh, phenofibrates have more data. Uh, Gemfibrozil has a very big problem that it is considered a very high risk with interaction with statins and it increases the myopathy five or more times. Phenofibrates uh, are the best. The data is there, it's consistent. And for primary prevention and certain cases of secondary prevention can be used, yes. Uh, we have the field study, it was a, a partly secondary prevention, which is important. Uh, these are the safest, and the lower dose of the 160 milligrams example uh, of a, a phenofibrate present in our market has shown the least amount of interaction with statins with a very potent reduction in both triglycerides and other uh, markers of lipid problems. Okay. I have a question uh, for you, Dr. Do, Ahmed. It's please, my sir, question. Please. Uh, the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, and the European Society of Cardiology, the European Atherosclerosis Society, we have confusing and different borderline numbers of triglyceride for going to treat for cardiovascular prevention. Yeah. We should not be confused. We need a number. At which number I should treat? Okay, um, um, I'll, I'll tell you. In primary prevention, the European uh, guidelines state it's above 200. Uh, and it's preferable if you have a triglyceride level below 150. Let's keep it European. It's simple. It's above 200 in primary prevention. Uh, if you have secondary prevention and you want to add something else for reduction of morbidity and mortality, it's uh, between 135 and 499. And that was the data of reduce it. 200 and above, treat the triglycerides. Below 150, perfect. Okay. And the question for Dr. Nabil. For the non-HDL cholesterol, when you recommend it to measure it? Um, um, I have a slide for this. Um, uh, um, is, uh, this non-HDL cholesterol, it is very simply. Uh, you can subtract uh, the HDL from the total cholesterol. And this is the non-HDL cholesterol. So it is very valuable in patients with high triglycerides. For example, in diabetic patients, in patients with metabolic syndrome, in such patients, non-HDL cholesterol will be much more important than the LDL cholesterol. 
and this should be our target in uh, in, in in the treatment for such patients uh, because uh, non HDL cholesterol we include both the uh, LDL uh, and uh, triglycerides. And for uh, Dr. Ahmad, Dr. Ashraf, Dr. Ibn Abil, for the diabetic patient who have uh, LDL cholesterol and have the triglyceride and the type 2 diabetes, would you advise to start with statins and fibrates to reduce the size of the LDL cholesterol uh, because we know the, uh, the action of phenofibrates with the VPAR gamma in diabetic patients? Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I, I'd like to hear from you. Well, uh, diabetic patient is a very important subset of patients because, as Dr. Nabil Farag uh, said uh, a couple of minutes ago, that not all diabetic patients are at the same risk category. You may have a diabetic patient with very high risk, you may have a diabetic patient with high, and you have a diabetic patient of moderate. No diabetic patient of low risk. Uh, uh, this depends on the duration of the diabetes, Depend the uh, other risk factors, in addition to diabetes, one or more, uh, target organ damage. Okay? So, first of all, categorize the risk of your diabetic patient and put an LDL goal. Okay? If you put an LDL goal and reach the goal, look at the secondary goal for the diabetic. He uh, hemoglobin A1C, the secondary goal, important goal, <coughs> triglyceride in the secondary important goal, non-HDL cholesterol in is an important secondary uh, goal. And especially in the diabetic, triglyceride is of utmost importance because diabetic patients usually ha have what we call a therogenic lipid profile. They have a high triglyceride, average LDL, and low HDL. This is a very dangerous atherogenic lipid profile that may conceive you and be telling you, hey, it's okay, the LDL is okay, and triglyceride is a little bit high, so you are reluctant to give him good lipid-lowering therapy and even combination therapy uh, for, uh, when uh, needed. Dr. Nabil? Voice. Voice. Uh, first, we will be targeting the LDL cholesterol. Um, and um, after six weeks, we'll check both uh, the LDL and triglycerides. And if the triglycerides is still above 200 in this condition, we have to add uh, fibrates or phenofibrates to lower the triglycerides. And first, targeting the LDL, except if the triglycerides from the start is very high above 500. So, if it is below 500, the primary target is LDL, giving only statin. And after that, if the triglyceride is still above 200 in this case, I will add uh, phenofibrate in addition to the lifestyle uh, modification. I think a lot of you can conclude uh, this uh, session. So, I'm not sure. Hello? Hello. So uh, we uh, have uh, this night uh, a presentation for the remnant cholesterol and the triglyceride uh, remnants as uh, uh, cardiovascular risk for atherosclerosis and a, a, a lipid uh, case study. And we learn how to uh, manage the triglyceride patient and how to use the fibrates, use the statins, and the, how the guidelines was different in numbers. And we know the numbers we should treat like European if the triglyceride is more than 200 milligram per deciliter. Uh, so, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Ashraf Rida, Professor Nabil Farag, Professor Ahmed Shawi for the enriching uh, information what we have, and uh, and, and, and I, I give the word for Professor Ashraf. Okay, thank you uh, uh, all, and it was a pleasure uh, to uh, discuss with you 
بروفيسور نبيل بروفيسور احمد شوقي اند بروفيسور عاطف ذيس امبورتنت توبيك اند اجين اي وود لايك تو ثانك ايكوم فور ذا تكنيكال سبورت اند ثانك ابوت فور ذا سي ام سبورت اوف ذا سي ام اي اكتيفيتيز اوف ذا يافا اند فور اول اور بارتيسيبنت توداي ثانك يو اول very much you uh, soon in another wave and be safe and uh, best regards okay thank you bye everyone thank you thank you, you very much dr ashraf dr atf and dr ahmed thank you thank you very much okay